二点、どのように分析しているか話してもらえますか。Well, firstly, you're correct, and your information is accurate that the,、uh, the overall music industry has experienced a tremendous slump since 1978.Record、uh, record sales, the total pre-recorded music industry is probably down、uh, by at least 50% in total unit volume. From 1978, and it, it is also true that 1978 is the point at which Journey really exploded, and we have、uh, grown geometrically since then. And、uh, each year,、uh, we have、uh, had greater success in total ticket sales, total record sales, total uh, uh, merchandise sales, and so forth. And I think that、uh, underlining that success would be the quality of the product, and that.、Uh, Clearly, you can point to、um, inferior product or、uh, a lack of continuity. You know, where where certain artists、uh, that did in fact deliver really high quality product、uh, failed to do so on a continual basis. And I cite situations, examples like Heart, Cheap Trick, Kansas,、uh, Queen, Ario Speedwagon, are all artists that. While at one point they made exceptional records,、uh, they did not continue to do so. And clearly, the the key reason for Journey's success is,、uh, as an entire organization, every day that goes by, every person is better at what they do because of their level of application. And their motivation and, and drive to do so. They're highly motivated, artistic people, artistically oriented people. Whether it's、uh, John Villanueva in promotion or Pat Morrow and his scope of、uh, duties, that everyone is aspiring to higher ground at all times. And I think that that is the underlying reason for our ongoing success. The artists themselves are especially that way. They're better、um, songwriters. They're better. Players, they're better singers, and they're better entertainers and performers every day because they're applied and because they want to be. So, what do you think accounted for the great continuity of quality for these other groups?、Uh, one can't say. You know, I think that um, uh, any industry could have experienced the same thing、uh, when it first happened in '78, and people started to、uh, really.、Uh, Draw attention to the fact that hey, our business is going down. Our business is going down. Well, if it was the motion picture industry, and in one particular year, you let's say created The Godfather and、uh, Jaws and、uh, E.T. and uh, 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 Raiders of the Lost Ark and all the great movies,、uh, and then the next year didn't happen to produce. All those same great movies,、uh, the motion picture industry might have had the same complaint, and it's really. But it wouldn't be because people didn't want to go to the theaters anymore. It would be because there was a downturn in the production and the output of that creative sector. That's really the key. I see, but you talk about the sales having gone into a slump from '78. Do you think the recession might have? Had well, to do with that? yes.、Uh, clearly, the economy—nothing escapes the economy. But if anything、uh, is immune to the ups and downs of the economy,、uh, over the years it's been proven that entertainment, the the real、uh, escape for people that are affected by the economy, is, has uh, uh, has avoided those problems. At least that was evidenced by the Great Depression in 29.、Uh, the theater houses really exploded, and、uh, live entertainment was、uh, did quite well in that period. What do you think about the actual business of making records in the future? Do you,、uh, you have an optimistic outlook or a pessimistic outlook? Well. I'm optimistic artistically and creatively, but、uh, I have to、uh, be somewhat pessimistic about the the world in, in general, and in insofar as the way that they、uh, have treated the creative 
sector at this point. I think that um, the industry and the consumer at the same time has a habit of eating our young and killing off our old. And and so the question I pose is, is when you've had great, great, great creative entities like the Beatles or the Rolling Stones or the Who or Led Zeppelin and the Eagles, um, which for all intents and purposes are no more. You know, uh, the Who has bid their farewell. Uh, the Rolling Stones, uh, God bless them, are up in their years at this point. Uh, uh, I will call it de facto retirement. And, uh, you know, Led Zeppelin, of course, is disbanded. And, and the Eagles have purportedly disbanded. And I want to know who is in line to... Or who is an heir to the throne for this legendary status? I don't believe anyone is. Uh, not Journey, per se, or anyone, I don't think, uh, have are earmarked for that. Um, and uh, so many of our young, uh, when they are successful, it's such a short-winded affair. Here today, gone tomorrow. Do you remember the knack? You know, do you, uh, uh, dire straits, uh, meteoric rise uh, on their first album, and now they struggle for critical acclaim and attention uh, and consumer awareness. Um, these are typical examples, and I'm, I, I think that there's cause for concern about that. You're talking about Journey not attaining the same status as, say, uh, who or the, the Rolling Stones, Led Zeppelin. Do you think that's possible for any group to attain that status? Uh, well, that's the question I'm asking. Yeah. I don't. I don't have the answer to that. Um, I don't know who is heir to that level of legendary status, and I don't know. Um, uh, certainly, there is no written formula to get there, uh, and it's something that is in the minds and the hearts of the consumers of the world, the the, the world music consumers. And I don't think. I just don't get the feeling that uh, we're the world music consumers are ready to exalt anyone to that level again and which means that um, uh, the consumer places a limitation on the the the, the height that, uh, that an artistic endeavor can reach now is being limited and uh, the the ability to break a new artist is extremely limited as well and when a new artist does successfully break, uh, then the careers seem to be much short-winded, uh, much shorter than than in the past. Already? Come on, next one. Eh, to. Album Frontiers, right? Hot chart, third. Budokan concert, also a success. Although you are now in Japan, you are the top band in Japan. But you have to get to this point. You have to get to this point. で、1回以上のペースでマメリアに来て、アメリカでのランクで言うならばね、小さすぎるようなこうやって there is uh, well, not universally with all the members friction there's uh, I think that um, that they are, try to refrain from reading their press whether it's positive or negative uh, when it's uh, really positive, uh, they feel that they might uh, start believing their own press and the hype and uh, uh, it, that it might have um, uh, an inflating effect on their egos, and so they, they're concerned about that. And they're also concerned that when they, if they read negative press, that it will, uh, you know, distress them uh, and strain them. And so, although they uh, have participated and cooperated with the press a great deal, uh, they don't want to read it. And of course we have reams of clippings uh, from uh, all their interviews and, and uh, you know, that is, they treat that like they do their music. They say what they feel, they give, uh, they make themselves accessible to the press, 
but uh, they don't feel like it's necessary for them to uh, criticize the critics. And uh, that's not what they want to do in life. And so they kind of do steer clear of it. They're, um, there has been a, occasions when they've wanted to cut back on their accessibility to the press because it's strenuous. Uh, if uh, it's almost like somebody asking you your name five million times, let's sit down and I'm going to ask you the same question five million times, and I'm going to see what your attention span is, and uh, you let me know when boredom sets in, you know, or or whatever. It's uh, you know, it's not really that easy to do. Um, yeah, I, that that cover kind of covers part of what you were asking. I probably didn't maybe phrase the question clear enough, but. It's like the public, the part in publicity they've had to play so far is probably a very large role in comparison to say what another band might do. In other words, other bands are maybe not that hot to push themselves as hot as Journey has been. You guys have spent a lot of time pushing the band. That's probably how you've gotten to where you have this day. Has there any, has there been any? Uh, put, have, have they been very, very cooperative? The members. Very. Very cooperative. Completely cooperative. They've had no... Completely. Yes, they, I think that they... Um, one of the things that was a, a, a cornerstone of my philosophy in managing them was that if they didn't... If I didn't teach them the business along the way and tell them the rhyme and reason and method to all the madness, why you do this, why this person's important, uh, what the intricacies are of retail and, and radio and uh, promotion and sales and marketing and merchandising. And they are, they have uh, probably, they are, I would say, the most aware artists in the business today. And the results of this are a, a genuinely sincere appreciation for the role that each person or each element plays in the overall picture. And I don't think that they've ever uh, exploited relationships or done what they've done with the media mix just to um, to really uh, further their own personal cause. I don't think it's been a really a self-centered effort on their part. I think that um, they are aware that uh, the people that are music critics are music critics because they love music. They can be a car mechanic or an elevator operator or a tax taxi cab driver instead. But they're in the music business and so they have a genuine respect for that person. And um, they realize that that person is dependent on accessibility to them. And, uh, you know, I, I just think that there's a much more mature and sophisticated attitude towards media in general. And uh, if that's resulted in a better rapport and, and better uh, information for the consumers and a better insight, then uh, fantastic. How about say uh, Jonathan Kane when he entered the band? Journey was already at at the top. Did he? Uh, was he? That's a bad choice of words. But was he indoctrinated, or was he already? He was he already thinking along those lines when he came into the band? I have never. And I, I must say this. I have. I've only presented the the truest picture that I can about what the business is, why it is the way it is. I've never put words into their mouths, ever. And no, I did not indoctrinate John Cain. Uh, it's really, I guess it's a bad choice of words. But well, no, it's not really. I, uh, I did not say, this is what you say, this is the party line for Journey. This is, uh, this is how we feel on this matter. This is, uh, this is our party line on this subject. It never took place. Uh, and in fact, I very much, personally, enjoy... I do read their press, and I enjoy it as a consumer. And I learn about them the same way Joe Sixpack, John Q. Public does. I really do. I mean, and I, I think what's really tremendous is even though we're close friends and we have total rapport, that I learn things from reading that press. And that tells me that journalists get things out of them and are, this is their life. They ask questions that I would never think of. And I can't tell you how frequently I'm surprised at their replies. I don't, and I the insights that I get. 
and it, it's demonstrative of really thorough and and quality journalism. And I think that the their perception of journalists and of the media allows that to happen. And I think it makes media is an art form, and it makes that better. And I think that uh, it really reverts back to, and it makes me happy because the, truly, when I founded the, this company ten years ago. I simply stated our goal is to make as many contributions to the state of the art as possible on all levels, whether it's media or sound or lights or staging or whatever it is. And I think that uh, that uh, we've we've been successful in all regards, and and the media uh, has gotten more out of Journey, and perhaps Journey also has gotten more out of the media. That's a fair exchange. Do you ever look back and think I could have done it better? No, never. 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 You've come 100% all the way. 100% all the way. I would have to say that. Would not change a note. Wouldn't do anything differently. Um, have had a thoroughly enjoyable experience. Thank you. Okay. While you're reading your message here. えっと、なんかさかにメディアのワルクシーだね。メディアのワルクシーだね。え、ボーカルレッスンやらしたいね。スティーペリーを連れてきたり、いわゆるその手のバンドの方針をあなた自身が決めてるという話ですけれども、本
I thought I could do that with just a, a little less of the um, um, the arrogance that jazz represented at that time. And that was really the main thrust at that point. And so I talked to Neil in those terms, and I reminded him of a couple recording sessions that he had played with Ross Valerie. I reminded him of... Uh, uh, I went and took him to a Tubes concert. I was involved with the Tubes at that time, and there was two drummers in the Tubes, and um, <clears throat> they both were very fine. But I, in particular, Prairie Prince was uh, exceptional. And uh, I showed Prairie to Neil and uh, said, he is my chosen drummer. And uh, George Tickner was a fine uh, guitarist, a rhythm guitarist and composer that had a great number of uh, uh, superior compositions. And so I, I, Neil agreed with me on each choice. And so I went to each party and put together what was uh, then called the Golden Gate Rhythm Section. Uh, and I went to each artist, and they each were involved in other things. Uh, George was playing with the Jerry Garcia from The Grateful Dead and his band. And I went to each guy and I said, you know, S San Francisco is the cultural center of America, but we don't have the Muscle Shoals rhythm section here. Why is that? Why is it the famous recording artists, solo artists, don't come to San Francisco to uh, record their records? There isn't a rhythm section. Let's have this outboard sidebar project of a rhythm section. This was, of course, a farce. I was, I was just wanting to put them together, and this was the line of reasoning that worked. And so, uh, and so we got together with Ross Valerie, George Tickner, Prairie Prince, um, and then I approached Greg Raleigh, and uh, we started to record there in mid-73. And uh, by late 73, John Villanueva had decided that Journey would be a great name for these guys because of the way they played. They would start a song in a very serene place. They would take you way out musically and bring you back. And I think that that's what inspired John to say, let's call these these guys Journey as opposed to the Golden Gate Rhythm Section and let's really, this is a band. Well, then we went through our basic changes from there. Prairie Prince couldn't leave the tubes because the other drummer died of cancer. His name was Bob McIntosh. He died at 22. And so we were heartbroken about both his death and the fact that Prairie Prince couldn't leave the tubes. Well, um, we, uh, we had to start the group, and so we played our first show ever on uh, January, well, New Year's New Eve for Bill Graham. Yeah. The second show ever was New Year's Day in the Crater, and Prairie Prince played on those shows. Within a month, I had acquired the services of Ainsley Dunbar, who was really the only drummer capable of filling Prairie's shoes uh, at that time, in my feeling, and I was very happy that he was uh, so inspired by the in individuals involved as he was playing with David Bowie at the time in, in Paris. But he came to America and joined Journey, and in fact, uh, by February, was playing shows with Journey. And the group continued along the lines of that rock fusion uh, concept, but you know, you can only go so far in that way. And I wanted them to be more than just the great players. And I was trying to coach them uh, and telling them that they all had to develop their skills as composers and as singers and as entertainers, uh, as well as continuing to, vel uh, to, to develop as players. One thing here, and I think this is one very important point he wants to touch upon, is how you, not a, a musician in the band, a working musician within the band, were able to talk, to get these guys to listen to you. Oh, because I, I am a musician. Originally, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. When I started my career at 14 years old, I first was a drummer and then a guitarist. Or, actually, I was first a saxophonist, then a drummer, then a guitarist, and although I never really developed... Uh, my expertise to a, a fine degree, I uh, very definitely have very strong rapport. And also my rapport was developed throughout my experiences in working with these artists in, in Santana or in the Steve Miller Band where they we had developed a tremendous level of respect for each other. And uh, they knew that um, I 
Well, you, just like any person has the ability to reason, and you know when somebody's making sense. You know when it's right, and you, you feel it. You know, I think that they knew that what I was telling them was accurate. Uh, and uh, they were receptive to my input, and they knew they had to develop these other skills. Uh, you know, I would do different things and different ploys, psychological ploys. But basically, I would say to Neil Sean, you know, Neil, you are that young protege that scares every guitarist to death. But if all you are is just a guitarist, believe me, you're going to look over your left shoulder someday, and there's going to be some young kid that's just going to be tremendous, a tremendous player. And all of a sudden, Neil Sean will be that that fast draw, that fast gun that that will be forgotten and there'll be a new kid on the block unless you have developed your skills as a composer and as a singer and as an entertainer if you're swinging that big a bat chances are you're gonna hit the ball all the way out of the stadium and that uh, that philosophy is as borne out and so they once they agreed with me then they said but how do we learn and so I put them together with various teachers, vocal coaches, um, uh, Pamela Poland, uh, Bianca Thornton, uh, in San Francisco. I, I enrolled them in the, in the, the, what was it called? The Family Light Music School. Yeah, right, sure. In uh, Sausalito. Yeah, right. And uh, they, they developed their skills as vocalists. And, and all of a sudden, their songs, they started, you know, the, if you listen to each Journey record, the first Journey record, uh, you know, it's probably half instrumental. And then all of a sudden, the second one, you're talking about song orientation. And uh, by the third album, Next, Neil Sean was singing lead on two songs on the album. And, and from a person who couldn't sing at all during the recording of the first record, to background vocals on the second, to lead vocals on the third. And by the completion of the third record, here's here's four guys that have really learned how to sing, including Ainsley, although we never used it, and who have really learned about songs, and and have gone from the attitude of, hey, we're hip musicians, uh, to to do these songs like that as a cop out. That was their attitude originally, but as they were educated and analyzed by the end of the third record they said they were they had the ability to really appreciate a great Lennon McCartney composition not that they didn't originally but now much more so than than before before it was just appreciated as a consumer but now appreciated as a professional it's much different and they were hoping that they could rise to the occasion to be able to create a song that would bring happiness into far more homes than what they were doing. They realized that the, the rock fusion, although it was artistically meritous, appealed to a very narrow audience, and that if you could create something that appealed to a broad audience, that that was a, a much taller task, a much harder thing to do. And uh, they... Uh, at which point I said to them, um, you know, now that you guys have developed your vocals to the extent that you have, couldn't we really enhance our live presentation as entertainers by giving the audience a vocal focal point? And now that you guys have developed your skills as, as singers, you could support a lead vocalist tremendously vocally instrumentally and w what would it be like guys if there were there was a lead singer in this band that was as good with his instrument his voice as Neil Sean is with his guitar wouldn't that give us nuclear superiority <laughs> you know so to speak and they agree and I said gentlemen I think I'm gonna start looking for that person N none of them said I know a guy and I'm gonna bring him over here I'm gonna oh no none of them said that no, that was that was always my job. Is that right? Oh sure. So okay, let's find us a guy, Herbie. Hey, well, listen. I mean, each one of them knew that I'd handpicked them. Yeah. And they all were very happy with my <laughs> choices, and they just said, uh, no "Let's go." Yeah. And in fact, this is when we get to the best part of this whole story. Uh, a friend of mine, a promoter in um, 
Denver, Barry Fay, uh, managed an artist named Robert Fleischman. And uh, he came out to audition to be that vocalist, and I met with him first, and then I felt good about his voice, and I felt good about his demo tapes, and I took him in, and uh, Journey immediately loved him. All right. And he joined the group. And uh, we s wrote songs together with him, like on that were eventually recorded on the Infinity album. Hmm. He participated as a lyricist on Wheel in the Sky. Um, anyway, any, anytime. Yeah, anytime. Um, maybe two more songs. Uh, uh, Winds of March. Yeah, I think Winds of March. Excuse me, Winds of March. He wrote. Um, he was a very song, song, very fine songwriter. He had the, which is a, a prerequisite. Mm. You know, he was a, a good songwriter, a good vocalist, uh, good m musical orientation. He had the, the wherewithal to present his material on either guitar or piano. Very important. And um, he fit into the group. And they liked it a lot. And we went on tour with Emerson, Lake and Palmer with Robert singing. And uh, we played from Hawaii to, to Miami uh, nationally. And uh, we got very strong reviews. Um, and it was, um, well, I can't tell you how happy Journey was with that choice. Yeah, very happy. And I, but there's the, one of the most unusually cosmic stories must be told about Steve Perry. Steve Perry was someone I met when we were working with a group called Azteca in 1972. And he was a very close friend of John Villanueva's brother, Jackie. And uh, Jackie's roommate was his cousin. And I met him then, and he seemed to be such a nice person. And he sent me a tape, oh, a year later, a reel-to-reel -reel tape, but I didn't own a reel-to-reel -reel tape machine. But I always had this strong feeling about him. I don't know why. Somebody was really important to me, was looking for a lead singer, and I, although I'd never listened to the tape, I sent that reel-to-reel -reel tape to that person and said, this guy's great. I told, told him he was great, even though I hadn't heard him. And um, when I was driving over the Golden Gate Bridge with John, Villanueva to negotiate with Barry Fay to put Robert Fleischman in Journey. That was another one of those occasions. This is many, many years later. This is not 72, this is 77. I turned to John and I said, John, remember Steve Perry? He goes, yes. Why are you thinking of him now? I said, God only knows. Why am I thinking about him now? I, I kind of feel like I could be making a mistake. Why haven't I ever made the effort to hear this person? I mean, anyway, we, we went ahead and we made our negotiation with Robert Fleischman, and he was in the band. And we were with the journey in Hawaii, and I was talking to our product manager at Columbia Records in Los Angeles, and he said to me, um, gosh, I almost wanted to leave my job with Columbia Records to manage this group that the label passed on. I can't believe the label passed on the group. And uh, we were talking about it, and I said, well, who's in the band? And he said, well, the drummer is an old, old friend of mine, Craig Cramp, and, and he starts naming people. And once again, this flash came over me. I stood up at the table at the Kaimana Hotel, and I said, you're going to tell me that the lead singer is Steve Perry. And he looked at me in disbelief, and he said, how'd you know? And I, I really, I just, it sent chills down my spine. It really did. It does now, just thinking about it. I said to him, my God. And I thought immediately how happy the band was and they were performing with Robert Fleischman. They just loved it. I said, please, please have him send me a tape. So he, Perry, Steve Perry was then working in the Hanford, Visalia area. Uh, he, um, was helping his father, uh, his stepfather, build homes, and he also uh, had a, a job on a on a turkey farm. And uh, he sent me a tape. And I was in my small office on Pacific Avenue, with, uh, where almost everybody in my company was in one room. And I got the tape. And I said, "Finally, I'm going to hear this guy." 
And for some reason, there was silence fell on the room. Everybody was off the phones. And I had a little Sony tape machine with a little speaker. And I put that tape of Steve Perry's in there, and I played it the first four bars. I mean, maybe 15 seconds. And I stopped the tape machine. And I, I had an anxiety attack and a spine-chilling experience all at the same time. Just hearing that voice that much, I knew. I just knew right then and there that something very special was on that tape. I fought, there was a number on the tape, and I got thousands of tapes over the years. And the fi I never, I'd listened to many of them, but I never felt moved or that I wanted to respond. I phoned him and I told him how much I loved it. And this was uh, just prior to the July 4th weekend in 1977. I told him, I want to listen to it over the weekend, and I'm going to call you back, uh, but this is the first time I've ever called anybody, and I, I just love your voice, and I can't believe it's taken me this many years to finally hear it. I listened over the weekend, and I love that tape, and I love that band, and I really thought to myself, wait a minute, Journey's great with Robert Fleischman, I, I want to manage this band, and I never wanted to manage anyone other than Journey before. So on Tuesday after the four-day weekend, I phoned Steve and I said, I want to manage this band. And he said, there's been a tragedy. The bass player died in an auto accident. He's integral to the group, and the group can no longer exist without him. And I said, well, that's terrible, uh, but I must, I must get together with you. Would you please come to San Francisco and stay with me in my home, and let's talk about things. Let's talk. And I finally talked him into coming up, and uh, I then realized that, uh, well, not completely. I didn't completely realize uh, that I wanted him to be in Journey at that point. Uh, actually, the trigger was that my wife had also fallen in love with that tape of Steve Perry. And we were playing in the Bay Area at the Cow Palace and the Oakland Coliseum with Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. And... Um, I was taking Steve Perry to these shows, introducing him to both Journey and anyone else as John Villanueva's cousin. And I didn't tell people who he was or that he was a singer. And I went to sit in the 12th row center with my wife to watch Journey perform. And she turned to me and she said, how can we enjoy listening to Robert tonight when we've been listening to Steve's tape for two weeks. And I was shattered <laughs> because she was absolutely right. I couldn't believe it. it. You know, I really... And so about two days after that, um, I removed Robert from the group. And if there was ever a decision to where I had total conflict with Journey, it was that decision. Uh, Neil Sean really loved Robert Fleischman. And... Uh, when I then told him, I, Steve Perry, this guy that I've been telling you is John Villanueva's cousin, is, is a singer, and I want him to replace Robert. He was adamantly against it. And um, there was other friction in the band about it. But I knew I was right. And I gave Neil's wife at the time, Steve's tape, and I said, play this at home. You know, when he's just waking up, put it in the cassette machine and let it rip on the stereo and and uh, sure enough about a week later Neil phoned me and said you know Herbie you're right that guy's heavy and uh, I had him out on the road um, he had been, he'd been out on the road watching Journey perform and I finally talked Steve into joining Journey and talked Journey into accepting and embracing him and I think that uh, <clears throat> clearly it was a turning point um, we continued to develop some of the songs that Robert Fleischman had wrote and <clears throat> recorded uh, Infinity and the rest is history. <laughs> what has become of the uh, of Robert Fleischman? Well, Robert Fleischman took one or two of the songs that um, we kind of divided up the material that he had composed with Journey. He took some of the songs, we took some of the songs. We took three, he, to he took three. He then signed a recording agreement with uh, Arista and released... Uh, at least one, if not two, albums. Since then, I'm not sure what's happened with him. Barry Faye still manages him. Um, 
and he is talented. He's, he is a, a, a genuine talent. But uh, I, I don't. I think Steve Perry is an exceptional talent, and of course that's been borne out by our success. That answer is that. Okay, we're going to the next question. たくさんの会社を持ってるって話したんですけど、いくつぐらいどんな会社を持ってるんですか。で、年間の売り上げってのはどれぐらいなのですか。これからの事業計画はどんなものですか。He has word that you apparently own several different companies. First of all, how many firms do you own? Well, firstly, the myself and the artists are partners. I don't、uh, have the typical relationship. With them, you know, where I take a percentage of their gross、uh, and、um, then operate independently of them. We have,、uh, from the very beginning, we have been equal partners, and we have uh, uh, therefore I have operated on the same motives as the artist. If I benefit to the extent of their success or fail to the extent of their failure, we have,、uh, in order to make. Contributions to the state of the art on every level. We couldn't go with the status quo or what was then state of the art.、Uh, if we wanted to improve upon it, it would require the forethought and the investment、uh, and, and so forth. And so,、uh, in the areas of、uh, lights, sound, staging, rigging, trucking, busing,、uh, video, in these production areas. We、uh, developed a company called Nocturne Incorporated, which is the parent company of all of these production services. And we've made the investments, and we own、uh, the most state-of-the-art equipment and、uh, materials that exist in America, or perhaps in the world today.、Um, We provide these production services for a great number of clients, other than Journey, of course. Nightmare Inc. and Journey is one of the primary clients of Nocturne for all these production services. But other clients that use virtually all of our services are Loverboy, Quarter Flash, ABC, the Motels.、Um, of course, the Who used our video services on their entire farewell tour.、Uh, we are. We have just done、uh, hour and a half TV specials on Judas Priest, Sammy Hagar.、Uh, we're doing Culture Club.、Um, we're, so we're developing that entire video area、uh, significantly, and、um, we are hoping to do a major special on Bob Seger, the first that he's ever done. And、uh, these are areas where, although we have absolutely the state-of-the-art equipment. Our our philosophy has always been that equipment is never any better than the people that operate it, and so our battery of personnel is really the key. We have the best people. We provide tour accountants, tour managers,、uh, road managers,、uh, lighting designers,、uh, sound engineers,、uh, technicians for keyboards, guitars, drums, etc. Uh, and our battery, our personnel, our personnel pool, as we refer to it, is the the, the top flight flight people in production in America today.、Hmm. How many people they have on the payroll altogether? Oh, I'd say about forty. Forty people. That's all companies combined. All companies combined. The other companies we have: Weed High Nightmare Music,、uh, BMI, as a music publishing company. We have Twist and Shout ASCAP as a music publishing company.、Uh, we have. Various partnerships that have real estate investments,、uh, Barstow Partners. Partners, Daydream, Escape. Uh, <coughs> uh, clearly, there is 
uh, a diversity of our interests. Uh, what do these basically involve, though? What type of businesses are these? Say, if you were to list all these off, you well, have a lot of names, but I don't quite know what they well, are. Well, Barstow, let's say, has an apartment complex in Fresno, California. Oh, it's, it's not diverse. You yes, uh, Escape has owns the Escape Partnership owns the four-story building in San Francisco on a full city block. That's our nightmare's headquarters. Full oh, block. Yes, and we we. Um, uh, rather than uh, it's really the underlying the philosophy of all this is we if someone else had a lighting system that we thought was state of the art uh, and we rented it from them uh, at the end of a tour we would uh, lay out this tremendous amount of money and in exchange for their services uh, at the end of the tour we would just have maybe a wheelbarrow full of uh, receipts and our concept has been that if we feel that we can improve upon the technology and the equipment, and we feel that we have superior personnel, that we make the capital outlay to design and create and build the system involving our new technology. And uh, in, in many instances, we have been able to build the equipment for less than we would have paid in renting it. <laughs> And uh, therefore, you know, at the end of the tour, we have wholly owned assets that are fully capitalized, fully amortized, and um, we don't have to, uh, uh, we're, we're not uh, giving all our money to a third party. And the same is true of our company. We have to have uh, 10,000 to 12,000 square feet of space to operate our business. We could pay an enormous rent to someone to do that, or we could uh, have a nightmare pay off a real estate investment for a partnership that we would create. So that's what we've done. Hmm. Uh, this might overlap with what we were just talking about a second ago about making records and whatnot, but they talk about video playing a very large part in selling uh, records these days, and selling a band's image, and also the possibilities of video discs as well. It seems like you guys are ready at any time to make the switch or to operate parallel in other words records vid video disc and video all at the same time we had that vision when we began the band and in our building in san francisco there is a large room that is a chronicle of video on this band from day one is that right we have videotape of the band recording their first record is that right there is i would venture to say no artist ever that has such a documented history in videotape. Mm -hmm. And it's every tape is labeled and been previewed and has a legend inside. And um, it's like a time capsule. <laughs> you know, it's a, a total in depth review of the many stages uh, of this band. If you wanted to see what the band was like when Robert Fleischman was in the group, we have several shows to, to show you. So just out of curiosity, is a full length feature film in the in the making yes. the, oh really yes there is in fact a motion picture that is this is one of the things that we we have um, we must have you know several concerts uh, maybe uh, 12 entire concerts uh, videotaped uh, and in the can so to speak in our library that have never been released to the public. We have, of course, a great number that have been released. but And we've also done thorough documentaries on every aspect of our operation. Um, but we've never done one that we really felt like taking to the public. And in this year, this tour, we are doing one, and we've chosen to use um, the film crew... Uh, they're known as NFL Films. They do all of the National Football League hmm. in America, and they're the best cameramen and the best people in the business. They have the state-of-the-art film facility in New Jersey, and uh, they're going to be doing a, a major-length feature film on the group this year, and that will we probably will take the video disc in the home video market. Hmm. When, when do you think that'll uh, be released? Uh, I would say it'd probably be out in uh, July of uh, 83. So they are this year. That's <laughs> right. I was just going to just remind me. What is your uh, profits over for a year, like say last year? Our profits. All, all companies put together. Well, we, you know, you must understand it's a big difference between gross, okay, well, gross. revenues and profits. Gross revenues. But our, the 
82 gross revenues was $75 million. That, that's divided into uh, about $22 million in ticket gross, uh, about $11 million in merchandise gross, and about 44 in uh, records, total record sales. Mm. This is uh, the record sales are computed at 6.98 per unit, mm. uh, which is probably an average retail cost, maybe a little low. And uh, the the uh, 22 million dollars in tickets and the 11 million in m merchandise, T-shirts and such, are very accurate figures. And uh, I think that uh, Journey's nightmares take out on that gross was about. 16 million dollars 16 to 20 million mm -hmm. in that range mm -hmm. yeah. and then once nightmare gets the money mm -hmm. it has to pay its expenses and overhead and so forth um, our business is uh, uh, very efficient and therefore about 70 percent of nightmares gross is distributed directly to the principals, mm -hmm. and which is probably the most efficient business operation on the continent. Mm -hmm. You think you run the most efficient rock operation? Absolutely. Anybody come close? I don't think anyone comes close. Have you been working close enough with other bands, say Santana, to see where they have failed, where you, whereas you have succeeded? Well, Santana, um, well, you know, I, I would say as a band, when you're trying to distribute to a lot of equal principles, that no one comes close. It's easy for one to generate for Carlos Santana a tremendous level of income. Carlos is a very wealthy man, as is Bob Seeger or Bruce Springsteen. <clears throat> when you have um, basically your band is uh, non royalty artists, salaried side people, and so forth, it uh, certainly lessens the burden. Hmm. Um, but I, I, to clarify, I think that very few artists in the world gross in total tickets and merchandise and, and albums are gross figures. And that virtually no one has the yield per unit sold that Journey does per ticket, per song, per album, per uh, t-shirt or what have you. Uh, the kind of yield that we have mm. per unit, mm. and uh, you know, the, you pay the same for, um, let's say, a Jefferson Starship album as you do a Journey album, mm. and um, if uh, if Journey sees uh, more money out of that than the Jefferson Starship, God bless them. You know, is is my attitude, and the public should feel good about it. I think that the, one of the most disheartening things for me as a business person is to see artists that make su substantial contributions to the state of the art and, and quality artistic efforts uh, starving to death a few years later. You know, it's really disheartening. You know, the, the, the business is so notoriously here today and gone tomorrow for an artist that when they are successful, they need to get as much out of it as possible because it's probably their their lifetime livelihood, mm. and and therefore it's really important that this take place. Mm. Why are you so crucified in the American press? And what do you think of the term corporate rock? Well, you know, uh, I think that um, that the American press is very much the the last. It's I almost call it the Watergate decade, where journalism has cheapened to a uh, to a great extent, and the reason it did is it, pretty simple. All the the journalists that were really took pride in their craft, and um, I, I know they have terminology for this that that I that I wish it was on the tip of my tongue. But, uh, you know, not cheap but, or shoddy journalism, but really uh, in-depth coverage, professional approach. Um, you know, it, there used to be a day when the form was a, a more pure, and journalism was investigative, thorough, unbiased, nonpartisan reporting of the facts. And that was the pride of the industry. But in those days... The media was not 
such a uh, wasn't a giant business. The the biggest corporate business in America, and if it's the biggest in America, then it's the biggest in the world, is the media. Nothing generates more revenue and is more corporately oriented than the press itself. And it's uh, really uh, kind of ironical that they would say corporate this or corporate that. <laughs> you know, people in glass houses shouldn't throw <laughs> stones. But clearly, TV and newspapers, it's been said that the most profitable single corporation in America is the Wall Street Journal. Uh, the second most profitable is American Express, just for your information. The, and it's based on the cost per dollar earned <laughs> and the investment required per dollar earned. To print the Wall Street Journal is nominal. To print and distribute is a nominal cost. And the revenues from the subscribership and readership and the advertisers is just unbelievable. And so it's an extremely profitable endeavor. Uh, but what has really changed the media is the overwhelming success of publications like the National Enquirer in America or the Star. Uh, they're constantly being sued by artists and, uh, and entertainers because they're looking for cheap headlines. You know, Tom Selleck of the famous TV show was seen with Victoria Principal of Dallas, another TV show. And, uh, you know, just cheap shot headlines that sell newspapers and sell publications. And, and uh, I think that that um, is what has really changed the media. And so everybody uh, wants to pigeonhole everything in life. Why do you think they criticize you for being corporate rock, though? What's their point, and how, how do you counter that? They never make the point. There never is a point. It's like, you're the military-industrial rock complex. End of statement. Well, is that bad? Is that good? Is it negative or positive? They, I think that they try to present it in a negative light. I think that when you're successful, if you are a struggling... It's amazing. Uh, there's a point in, in Journey's career where we were championed by the press, where we were their little pets and their heroes, you know. Uh, and when we would open to major headliners, before we were a headliner, Journey destroyed so-and-so, you know, and really outdid him. When we became a headliner, someone else was destroying us. Whether that, that was true or not is irrelevant. It sells newspapers to say, Journey, uh, tremendously powerful, uh, tremendously successful and popular band, evidenced uh, or showed why they are with their brilliant performance. Oh, that's that doesn't sell newspapers to say that. We're there in an, um, to present the facts accurately and unbiased and unpartisan is totally boring and doesn't make a profit. And so they slander anything that's successful whether it's the President of the United States. I mean, no one is safe. No, there are no sacred cows with the media. And so uh, anyone that's in the press, a negative angle is much more viable in terms of generating revenue than a positive angle. But they do continue to uh, praise the Stones. Oh, I, I don't think so. You don't think so? I think it's really mixed. I mean, that their last tour was definitely a media event. Mm -hmm. And I think that they wanted to uh, uh, say, hey, look at how big this is. Look how big this is. And, and um, uh, to <clears throat> they wanted to present it in, in the, and couch it in the terms of how big it was, economically speaking. Uh, you know, how, look how old these guys are, yet they're still monstrously successful. And uh, there's a that I think is much, much more the exception to the rule than the rule, that they found a good press hook other than slander. And so, hey, let's go with it. It's working. Um, and also, you know, America is so frequently referred to as the nation of sheep. Monkey see, monkey do. And there was enough press that was generated that was in that direction that it uh, had a domino effect and virtually all the press then followed suit and ran in that direction as opposed to going against the grain. It was some against the grain, especially in uh, critiques of their actual performances. 
but the notoriety being brought to the event was tremendous. Mm. <laughs>